Okay, it looks like it's time to begin. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, um, let's see, to start off, there's been a couple of questions about the exam. And so I'll try and answer them again. And so Too many windows. So the first question people are asking about is number two on the COVID data. Um, you know, basically, um, Compute, you know, how many cases, confirmed cases there were in the country per week. Um, and then produce a table results and then also um, use a log line plot to look at it. And the reason for the log plot, plot is that when things grow exponentially um, and your normal plot, it can be sometimes difficult to determine um what sort of growth rate we've got so when we do a log plot the uh, lines uh, exponential growth will look like a straight line um, um, let's see next question um, so number five, you know, basically you want to find the counties, the 10 counties with the most known number of cases, and then take those 10 counties and compute how many cases each county has each week, and then plot that and see if you can see any differences or similarities. In is there a pattern there or not? Um, let's see. Um, another question people have asked about is um, problem two on the name data. The model we're going to look, one model we look at is very, very simplistic. Um, and that is you just for each name, you compute how many times the male ha had that name and how many times the female had that name. And whoever had the most, whatever sex used that name the most, um, we'll just assume that that particular name belongs to that sex. And then we'll compare that to using a decision tree. See any questions? Now I can. Yes. Um, there we go. I lost. So there's one question. Um, I lost track who asked it. Oh, there we go. Uh, 
uh, Professor? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, my question is that uh, in the exam, you asked in some of the questions to uh, show the table, I mean, produce the table and draw the plot. Correct, yes. So uh, <clears throat> although this is a similar question, this was the same thing that you asked in assignment one, but just to be clear, when you say uh, produce a table, like what kind of format are you looking at? Or do you just simply mean the data frame or the series? Correct, the data frame and the series is correct, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next topic, we go on to formal lecture. Um, so we got four weeks left of classes. Um, there are a couple of topics I wanna to talk about. Um, one is Cassandra, which is a distributed NoSQL database. Um, and it's somewhat popular because you get good throughput. Um, I also want to talk about D3, which is a common library to display data. Um, and we also need to talk about projects. Now, typically in this class, um, what I've done in the past is I've had a couple of classes where we would, students would, you know, just get in front of the class and spend a couple of minutes talking about what their project's gonna be. And the motivation is um, I wanna make sure the project isn't too big or too small. I also wanna make sure that um, you thought about, you have a data set in mind um, I'm not sure how that will go in this um, new format. I'm going to try that in my next class this tonight, and I'll see how it goes. So I would think that tentatively we'll, we'll try this next Thursday, but I'll give you more details next week once I've got some um, experience doing a live demos by students. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, then I want to um, talk more about Kafka and streaming. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, things will make a little more sense in the, con in the context. Um, you know, basically, you know, think of, you know, say a, you know, a system like Walmart or even Amazon where you have a lot of different, Walmart might be a little more useful. You have lots of stores. You, you continually get an input from the stores and what they sold. Um, and you might want to have like hourly updates or every half hour know exactly where we stand. Um, and so one way we can do that is um, we basically have you know a big cluster for Kafka and all the stores are, you know are continually writing all their sales to this cluster, um, Kafka cluster. And then we, we feed that Kafka cluster into a Spark um, process. Um, and the Spark process says they're continuously reading from the imp from this, from the Kafka clusters, Kafka streaming service um, as the data pours in, and it'll spit out then, you know, an average of, you know, say we want to know average sales per half hour, so every half hour, you know, produce a window, a sliding window of here's what we sold 
here's how much revenue was sold in, the, in this last half hour. Um, and we'll see how to do that by the end of the lecture, hopefully. Okay. Um, so if we're doing a system like that, um, we want to make sure that data is going to be delivered. Um, and since we're in a service system, there are a number of issues you have to worry about. Um, one is uh, the producer starts writing, sends a piece of data to the um, Kafka server, and the server go and the producer goes down. Um, what happens? Um, another one is the producer the producer comes back up. It didn't get an acknowledgement from the server. So what do you do? Um, do you resend it or not? If you resend it, then you get a duplicate record. Um, and if you're looking at sales, you don't want to record sales multiple times. Um, another issue, what happens when the producer doesn't go down, they send, the, you know, send data to the Kafka server and the Kafka server does not respond back. Um, now what do we do, right? Does the producer try and send it again? Um, and how do we, how do we make sure that we don't get duplicate records and how do we um, make sure that thing is delivered? So the one question is, when do we know a message has been delivered? And Kafka gives us several ways of answering that question. Um, you know, so when the producer sends the data to Kafka server and there are multiple partitions, um, one way we could say we message delivered is when the partition gets the data, the first partition, um, but then the master partition has to replicate that information to all the follower partitions in case it then goes down. So we then can consider it done when that happens. Um, and then what happens is when, when the slave partitions have received the data, they acknowledge it back to the master. And then when the master gets that acknowledgement back, it then sends acknowledgement back to this producer. So there's several stages in which we can say, oh, um, we won't consider it delivered until the producer gets back at the acknowledgement from everyone. Or we could just say, well, as soon as the master gets the, gets the data, we'll, we'll be satisfied. Um, all right, so, you know, several options are, you know, when the master gets the message or when all the replicate partitions get it, and we get acknowledgement back. Um, now, if the producer doesn't get an acknowledgement, um, either because the network went down, the copy server went down, the producer went down, um, what happens? Well. Currently, um, if, if a producer resends a message, uh, Kafka will, will catch that. Um, you know, so what happens if the producer goes down, doesn't get the acknowledgement, not there, not producer comes back, now it doesn't know what happened, right? Was the message sent or not? Um, How do uh, we guarantee the delivery? Um, so we give each producer has an ID. Um, and when you send a message um, to the Kafka server, you um, give it a sequence number 
and that allows Kafka to then check. Um, have we seen a message with this ID and sequence number before? If so, then it's a duplicate. And then data transactions, um, which allow you to send multiple messages to multiple topics, and they either all will succeed or fail. And so you'll see at various points how uh, databases and SQL has crept into lots of this. Um, And so the producer can do several things. Um, it can be asked to be notified when the leader and all the followers have gotten the message. We, not, we can also um, be notified just when just the leader's gotten the message. Um, we can also provide a timeout so um, we don't have to wait around. And the third, op third option is just We'll send the data um, and we don't need to get any notifications about whether it's received or not. Whenever we're doing the distributed system, we always have to worry about failures. Um, you know, when you run on a single machine, either your program is running or it's not running. Um, right? We never have a, a situation where a program is, a third of the program is running, a two thirds is not running. Um, but once we get distributed, we can have a system where part of the system could be down. Um, and a common way of doing this is replication. And so Kafka is going to um, reach partition, we're going to have a single leader and multiple followers. In a little bit, we'll see how to set that up. Um, And the followers basically read from the leader partition. Um, and, you know, then we can, um, each of the followers is either marked as being in sync or failed. And the way they do that is, we have yet another program called Zookeeper, um, which basically indicates, keep, Zookeeper can keep track of um, basically where all the partitions are, are and what state they're in. Um, and so the Zookeeper will know um, when a particular partition gets behind and reading and if it gets too far behind and reading from the master, it marks it as being not in sync or failed. Um, so when the leader dies or leader becomes so slow that no one can respond to it, all the followers which are in sync um, I looked at, um, yeah. we get the IRS replicas and the zookeeper keeps a list of them. Um, and when the partition, when the leader fails, then there's a vote to figure, to determine who's going to be the uh, new leader.
Okay, and this probably should have been a little earlier. Um, we can just talk about this and we'll see it a little later again. Um, Zookeeper um, is a system that's used just to keep track of your theory systems. Um, and the problem is, if I had a distributed system, how do I how do I know the current state of that system? How do I know which ones are running, not running, um, falling behind? And so Zookeeper is just a distributed system that's used to, like I said, monitor another distributed system. Um, and when you when you install Talk out, Zookeeper comes with it. It's part of the installation. Um, so again, it's a distributed system, and so Zookeeper will run can run on multiple machines. Why? Because it's a distributed system. It too can have problems, um, and so all the problems you know, regular distributed system can happen with Zookeeper. Um, so again, you got the same process where um, you know what happens when a zookeeper node goes down. Um, and then of course, um, you can ask who keeps track of the zookeeper. Um, at some point, you have to stop. Um, so, Kafka is pretty simple to run. Um, you download it, unpack it, um, and there is um, in the bin file, there's a script to start the zookeeper. And there's a, there's a configuration for Zookeeper. And then there's a, a shell script to um, run the Kafka server. And again, there's a bunch of um, files or properties to configure Kafka. Um, and there's also, I believe, a bat file for the Windows people. And to create a new topic, remember a topic is um, a different method stream. Again, there's a script to do that. We can create it. Um, we have to specify, we have to give it, you know, tell which zookeeper to look at. Um, how often, how many times we want to be replicated and how many partitions we want to use. Um, and then the actual topic. Here I'm using one partition because I'm running this on my, I was running it on my laptop, um, not multiple machines. I could have used multiple partitions, but it didn't. And also the replication factor is one because I'm only running on one machine. So far, so good. Um, again, there's a script to get a list of topics. Um, there are also scripts for producers and clients. This is just to um, play with the system and test it out. It's not how you want to do it um, in real life unless you embed this in some other script. Um, and so here, what I've done is running this script. And again, you need to give it, you know, which host to connect to and what topic you're interested in. And then, since the command line script, you just type in, I just typed in several messages. 
um, and then in a different um, terminal window, I started the script to become a consumer. And again, the same, what where you connect to, um, which topic I'm interested in. And there's various options of what we can, how we can read from the client. Um, one is we can say read from beginning. We can also just say, give me the current one and all new ones or just all all things coming in the future. And then I get no surprise, all the same messages that I sent earlier. You know, it's pretty much the same to run a, a cluster. Um, we need to edit the configuration files um, to know so the cluster know someone knows you want to make sure they're all the same properties um, and, and then we go to all the servers and run the script in each of the servers um, to start it up. Right, and we can again when we run it, determine how many how often how, how many backups we want, how many partitions we want. Um, and again we can get the topics. Um, right, and then we get the various replicas. And then all the nodes which are up to date or close up to date. Now I've gone all this time talking about messages that we send. What's a message? Um, well, on Kafka, they talk, you know, message is basically a record. And a record has a topic, basically what which stream we wanted to go in, has a key and a value. Um, and the records are serialized, which means they're turned into a sequence of bytes. Um, and so we need a serializer to take a, a record and convert it to a byte. Um, <clears throat> And so any message we send needs a serializer. We'll, we'll see examples of that. And that cons the consumer also needs access to that to take the, the byte stream from Kafka and convert it back to um, the record we want. And we've got two options. One is we can attach the serializer to each message, or we can register that serializer with the zookeeper and the, and the client can download the serializer from Zookeeper. Um, and it doesn't, if a particular record is being sent a lot, you know, the last option is the only reasonable one. You don't want every client to continually have to download the serializer. So first I'll look at using Kafka in a Java program, and then I look at it using a um, in Python. Um, Kafka ships with um, the Java bindings. If you want to use Python, then you have to download a separate uh, consumer and producer. Um, So in, in Java, there's you know some methods to call for transactions, um, and then there's two send methods. That's it, right? And the first send method is 
That was the send things that we're worrying about. And message coming back, and then we have a callback to know when um, we get acknowledgement back from the Kafka server. And then there's two constructors. Um, and the second one differs in that you can give it the serializer to serialize that message that particular producer will send. So a sample producer, a bunch of, a bunch of settings for the producer, um, some important ones. Um, one is acknowledgments. Um, we're basically telling the system, look, I want send back an acknowledgment when the master has gotten the message and all the slaves got a message. Um, how often do I, how many times do I want to retry if, if there's an error? Um, how big of uh, basically a buffer do you want? So when we put these things in a batch, um, and then the serializers for the keys and the values. And once we have our settings for our producer, I instantiate an object, and I then create a new record of type string string. So this is the key, this is the value type, and that's it. And I'm sending. those records to the Kafka server. And which server is being sent to is again in the settings up here. To actually do a transaction, um, All right, give it a transaction ID. I start my transaction, initialize it, I begin it, I send a bunch of stuff. All right, and then I do a commit. Um, right. Anyone who's done transactions in a database setting, you should be familiar. And there's various exceptions that can occur. So far, so good. You know, in Java to read it again, we have a bunch of bunch of settings for the um, consumer. Um, yeah. I'm, Pulling, reading for 100 records. Um, and then I'm printing out all those records as I read. So basically, for the producer and consumer, um, you know, basically, you just set, you know, set various parameters up. Um, create the data, add a serializer, um, and send it, and the consumer does reverse. Now for some Python, um, like I said, there's no built-in Python producer or, or consumer. There's two um, Python 
um, systems. Um, the first one comes from the company that created Kafka. Um, the, you know, if you're a company, um, I like this commercial support. Um, And it does basically the C library to do most of the work. The um, other one is on GitHub. Um, it's it has twice as many stars as um, the Cthulhu one, and it's a, it's in pure Java, so we don't have to worry about any worries about running that C code. And so this is the one that I have used. Um, and you expect the um, using Python is a little simpler. Um, assuming that I've got my copper sort of running. Um, And I, again, I, I have my producer, again, um, various settings, um, again, which, where is my Kafka server, and Kafka um, compresses the, the other comp compressed records to make it faster to transmit. Um, so I'm specifying what type of compression type, and then there's this send, right? There's a send method, and then here again, here's my key, here's my value. Um, and the encode function in Python converts a string into a series of bytes. You know, I get the topic um, message, right? And this, depending the B to a string, converts the bytes um, that works for string literals, uh, then called is a little string literal. The consumer, um, again, is just with the consumer object. Um, and then we just read the messages from the consumer. And this basically is an infinite loop. Um, And so first I printed out the message itself. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of information about the record, the topic it was sent to, how many partitions, um, timestamp, um, there's no key value and then getting the value out and decoding it convert it back into a string. Right. Um, and this offset is where are we um, in the partition on the Kafka server. Remember each um, client has different offsets so you can check of where it is. And that's an infinite loop, right? It, it goes forever. Um, the whole system is basically a way of sending data um, from one place to another in a continuous stream. Um, here I'm just showing you Python 
producer and client sending and receiving, but presumably the producer is somehow generating the data or getting data from the sensor, from the cash register, um, and the consumer is then actually doing something with the data it gets. Right, and the producer, right, the topic you want to send to the value of the key. You can add some headers, this partition, and timestamp. Now, when we do this, right, um, if that topic doesn't exist, it will be created. Um, and remember, this is the use case is the producer is on one machine and right, the consumer is on machine and the Kafka server is somewhere other place. So the Kafka, the Kafka Python producer does this asynchronously. Right. This method does not wait for the Kafka server to send knowledge in fact. What it does do um, is it returns a future object. Um, and then we can the future is basically a way of dealing with asynchronous messages. Um, when I try and read from that future, I'm going to block until the actual message is there. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to read um, on the future and give a timeout. Um, if the message doesn't get back in that length of time, then the exception is raised. Otherwise, uh, we get an acknowledgement and we can look at the acknowledgement and see what happens. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. Um, does it matter what we encode as? Yes, it does. Um, it matters because both the producer and the consumer have to agree in what the encoding is. Um, and it's sent as a sequence of bytes. And Kafka basically is all it knows about is bytes. Um, so it doesn't doing out doesn't really have to read a sequence of bytes, store those sequence of bytes, and send them off to the consumer. Um, so here what I'm doing is providing a serializer um, for the value. Um, And basically what I'm doing is right, taking a JSON object and encoding it in ASCII. And here is my you know, JSON I'm sending. The consumer is going to get that result of sequence of bytes, so it has to know how to reverse that operation. And so here's my consumer and here's my deserializer. Um, and so I have to decode the ASCII and convert it back into um, JSON. So we can encode it as ASCII, we encode it as UCF8 but both sides have to know which one we're doing. And here, 
um, just reading a single message instead of having infinite loop. Okay, any other questions? And here on the producer side, I'm defining um, two functions, um, one success, one on air. Um, and then producer, um, any callbacks. Um, so I, I'll get an acknowledgement back on success and if something goes wrong, I'll get it your message. Here, um, certain retries. Um, so again, what's going to happen is Profit will send it, will try to send a message five times before it gives up. Um, and I want acknowledgements back. Um, and the options up here for acknowledgements are zero, which is don't wait for any response. Um, one is to wait for the leader wrote the message a lot, the leader has it. And all is um, you know, wait until all traditions have received the message and get some knowledge of that. So it's you know Kafka is a fairly simple system to use. Um, you know if you have it, if you need to be streaming data. Um, There's a high throughput, high reliability um, system. Now let's connect it to Spark. Um, the first thing to note is Spark does have its own streaming system. Um, so it actually has two of them, one for RDDs and a second one for data frames. Yeah, let's go, let's go back. Um, so we can ask the question, if Spark has its own streaming system, why do we need Kafka? There are a couple of reasons. Um, you know, we need to get data into Spark, um, and so we need the Kafka server for that. Um, and we may, may need our streaming system to connect to various endpoints besides just Spark. Um, now let's when we're, we're streaming in Spark, the operation is slightly different because we're not getting all the data at once, right? Um, we process the data when we receive it. Um, and so basically it, it groups our data into batches and send each batch to the Spark engine. And then the Spark engine is going to spit out the other end batches, right? Again, separate batches. So basically, Spark streaming is going to accumulate. As things stream in, it's going to accumulate into a batch, send the batch to Spark. Spark can process it and output an, a batch. And it's basically, again, a, a streaming process, right? So a bunch of batches come in, a bunch of batches come out.
So again, if we're looking at you know, keeping track of sales data, um, Walmart, um, you can imagine you know, this huge stream pouring in from all the stores, gets put in batches, and then the spark engine spits out, you know, probably running window of say half hour result. So we can, we can think of right all these batches as just additional rows on a table or a data frame. Um, every time I get a new batch, um, we attach those rows to our, our data frame. Um, Uh, now we get um, the fun part of what does time mean in a distributed system and what happens when things are late? And what does late mean? Um, the first thing you note is there's no real way to synchronize clocks on a distributed system because there's going to be a lag between messages being sent from one machine to another machine. Um, and if we're sending this over the network, um, there will be delays in transmission. If we're sending over TCP, of course, if packets can get lost um, because a router gets, the software gets full, so sort of dropping packets. So packets get resent. Um, so messages sent later can arrive sooner. Um, and so Spark um, deals with um, events as they pour in. Um, the structure streaming, the new system can um, Processing is based upon their event time, um, which the producer will add to the event when it sends it to Spark. And that causes some interesting things. Um, we have to worry about, again, the system. Um, what happens when the Spark application fails? Well, um, Spark uses checkpointing where it's going to save its current state periodically. Um, and when it happens, then Spark has to reread some of the input. Uh, and so the requirements are your source has to be replayable. You know, what happens if the Spark is running, it's read a bunch of messages, it dies. Um, but it, it saved a checkpoint 10 minutes ago. Then when you restart it again, it's gonna to wanna to read the last 10 minutes of messages. Um, so that whatever your source is has to be replayable, um, which um, is, remember Kafka is replayable in the sense of each client can have a, um, index and where it is in a partition. Um, so a client can always go back to it so far or look at the last, this last um, index in that partition. Oh, where are we? Okay. Um, This one's a fun one, right? Um, this is 
You worry about the other end. Um, what happens now, so let's say we have um, every 10 minutes we do a checkpointing and on minute nine, our Spark application goes down, we restart it. Um, but before it went down, it was sending data after the checkpoint, it was sending the data to its output, um, and now it dies. We have a process to restart Spark system. It goes back to that checkpoint. It's going to replay those last nine minutes that already sent, and it's going to send those messages again to its output. Um, and now we've got the problem of wait, are, are we going to be repeating the same output several times to our end result? Um, and so the answer is yes. And so that's why they want the sync to support idempotent operations. What does that mean? Um, it means if we replay the same operation, we get always get the same result. Um, adding numbers is not item potent because if we add the numbers again, well, if we start from zero, we'll get them. But if we don't start from zero, adding numbers will give us moves further along. So we need to be able to, um, if I end up redoing operations, those operations have to give the same result, regardless of whether it's done before or not. Oh yeah, it has all the fancy features, right? It's fast, it's scalable. Um, So let's see a couple examples. Um, and here, here it is. I've got a stream of words. I'm going to be sending to the Spark Word Count program. Um, and the Spark Word program is to keep track of how many times each word has appeared in the stream as opposed to how many times it appeared in the file. Um, so I'll say at time one, I send cat, dog, dog, dog. Um, and then a little bit later, I send two more words, owl and cat. And then later again, I send owl and dog, right? Um, how this work? Um, so here is, you know, a word count program in Spark and Python. The difference here is it's not going to be reading a file, it's going to be read from an input stream. Um, so, you know, it's a bunch of imports, nothing different here. Again, I create my Spark session. Um, now, what happens, the change here is um, number one, okay, Spark is a read stream. Uh, from a socket, um, and again, I'm running this machine, I'm running both Spark and Kafka on the same machine. Um, so I'm actually using Kafka in this, in this, and sending data um, to a socket. So Spark is gonna be reading um, on this port. Um, Now we're getting the return value. Um, I'm now going to, which we can conceptually think of just all the lines of the sent. Um, and then I'm going to convert those lines into words. And by splitting on the space, um, and then I'm doing a normal you know, group by word and give the count, um, which you've been doing in Python, right? And now, given that output data frame, I'm going to um, write it out 
um, right to the console. And then I have this query await termination. Um, what's going to happen is this program is basically in a loop, which you don't see. Um, it's going to continually right read the lines once they get get some input and it's going to, it's going to separate the lines is then going to do the group by and then it's going to um, write up right to this console and they keep on doing that until um, the input stream is closed So it runs until you call stop or except, you know, exception occurs, which will happen if the socket is closed. Um, so here's what happens, right? So I sent in time one, I sent cat dog dog dog. Um, Right, I get the input. Um, I split it into, as lines. There's two lines. I split the lines into words. I send. I do the group by, and here is the result of group by. Um, and that's output to the console. Sometime later, right, I sent owl cat, um, and now right my input. This input is added to the bottom of my data frame. I now do write the group by query. Um, here's the result, and that's printed it out. Time three, right? I now send dog owl. Um, those two lines are appended. We then process the whole thing um, again, and we get you know, this data frame sent to the output. Right, so it's, the operation is different than we, we expect in regular Python or regular Spark because, right, there's this weird batching going on. Um, And we're accumulating a bunch of results. Any questions? All right, so then, you know, actually running the example, right? Here's my input. Um, you know, this is sent. Then here's a batch I got printed out. Right here, after sending all cat, here's the output I got. Um, and here's my third output after sending dog owl. Right, and again, it's now. For the output, we've got various options. Um, right, so I had complete, um, which means basically we're going to accumulate results and we send all the results, right? So all the rows are sent. Um, I could ask for a pen. Um, in that case, every time I send an input batch to Spark, the output only contains the new rows. Um, and the other one is update. Um, in that case, we only get the rows which are updated from that batch. It depends upon um, what type of information you're looking for. Are you looking for accumulated total? Or are you looking for just new data? Or are you looking for that was updated? All right. Um, you know, update 
you know, if you're looking at new cases of right COVID nine, you may not you may not want to get a list of all the counties that have all the same no changes, right? We just want to say what where the change occurred. How are we doing on time? I'm close. Um, there's a bunch of outputs we can use or sinks. Um, I was using a console and we can write to memory. Those are just for debugging so you can see what your program's doing. Um, you can write to a file. Um, we can also use Kafka as output so we can take the output and send it somewhere else. Um, there's also reach you can send it to um, input sources. Um, we can read from a file as a batch job. Um, we can use the Kafka. Um, and what I was doing is I was reading from a raw socket. Um, again, that's just for testing because you can basically open a socket and start typing um, using, you know, Telnet or Netcat. Um, so it's, you know, Kafka is a more likely server input to the whole system in production. Professor, there's a question in the chat. Um, okay. Um, does a write stream operation, is it using Spark streaming function or a regular function? Um, if we come back. Mm, um, it depends upon the context. Um, it's, you know, it's a regular function, right? You know, it's a regular write stream. Um, so it's a regular spark stream, um, but the behavior is slightly different. If we're doing regular Spark, um, it's basically be done once, right? When we call it, when we're we're in this sort of implicit loop, um, so I'm, so I'm doing um, my read stream is from a socket or from Kafka. Um, there's an implicit loop by, you know, given by this weight termination. So it is a regular um, Spark function, but it's behave, it'll be run multiple times in this case. And every time we get a new batch input, my write stream will be called again. And the other difference is that, um, If we're doing Spark streaming, there are certain outputs, there are only certain outputs that can be used. Um, and yeah, if we're using Kafka as the input, we need, um, You know, to add a Spark Kafka jar. Um, and so here's when I ran it, um, put in that jar file in my packages, in my submit to my local Spark system. Um,
And here's here's a slight inver variation. Here's a you know program using Kafka. Um, and again, the read stream input Kafka. Um, and then we need to know where it is. And then what are the partitions we're using? Um, And basically, the rest of the program is as before. All right, so we can use Kafka to stream data in and out of places, and we can use it um, to stream data into a Spark program to basically continue continue processing as more input comes in to the system then we'll get output, you know, which type of output we want. And yeah, and I modified the logger, so it would be so verbose. Um, and again, another example of different batches um, uh, we, um, I'll try, um, The question is how to regroup data. Um, and we give it a window. So I'm going to group everything in this window together. And then when, when a new window comes, I'll group it into that batch. Um, but usually the window will slide. So here's a window. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take everything that occurs in this and process it and up with that. But as time progresses and move forward, so some of the data is going to fall off. I'll drop that data, right? Um, and then here's my new window. Here's a moment up with the results from here, right? You think about it again. If we go back to the Walmart example, um, we have our Spark system running, and we have our thousands or tens of thousands of stores inputting data. Um, after a couple of months, right? It's going to be huge, um, and if you're only interested in um, in what's happened in the last half hour, we don't want the last two months data processed, right? Um, and so the question is: Does Spark process data from the previous batch and the next batch again? It, yes, if it's in the same window, right? Um, well, we process as part of that data frame, right? So we create this data frame, um, and we keep on building the data frame up. And yeah, I'll probably, um, I think I'll stop here, and then next time I'll back up a little bit and talk more about windows. Last minute questions. Professor, uh, I had a question. Okay. Uh, so in the assignment, uh, in the midterm exam, uh, what you've posted for the COVID question number two, yeah. uh, you, you've you asked us to calculate uh, the number of cases per week. So when right. you say a week, uh, do you actually mean like, uh, uh, since it's starting from 22nd, which is a Wednesday, so like, do you mean like from that Wednesday to the next Wednesday or uh, do you mean like from Monday to Sunday? Um, Either way it works. Okay. Uh, so like, because the calculations are going to be different if we like consider from a Monday to Sunday or like from a Wednesday to next Wednesday, so. That is correct, but they won't be that much different. Um, I can handle that. 
Okay, so we can do it either way, you mean? Correct. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we'll call it a day and I'll see people on Tuesday. <laughs>